Hey, uh, good morning, and welcome to the eighth annual Laurentian Bank Securities Institutional Investor Conference. My name is Nick Agostino, Head of Research and the Diversified Technology Analyst here at Laurentian Bank. Also joining me and assisting me is my associate, Salman Rana, who will assist you with moderating today's panel discussion. Before we begin, just a, a simple housekeeping item. Please ensure your microphone is on mute and your camera is turned off during the presentation. And please ensure your name appears on the screen correctly so that we can properly address you should you have a, a, a question. We will uh, pause uh, during the course of the today's chat to take any questions. So feel free to use either the chat box or the raise your hand feature. If you use the hand feature, make sure to lower your hand once your question has been asked and, and uh, answered. Finally, we've also put together a quick guide to help you navigate to, through today's uh, supply chain uh, discussion. And you'll see that in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Having said all that, let's get started. So joining us today for the panel discussion, we've got Alan Brett, who's the CFO of Descartes. Also on your screen, you see Canaxis's uh, president and CEO, John Sicard. And finally, we've got from Texas, President and CEO, Peter Barrington. So gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining us today. And uh, as Fareed Zakara likes to say, let's get started. So 2020, what I like to look at as a, you know, a year review, maybe just walk us quickly through what critical role you maybe are aware of where your software played a key component where your software you could highlight provided value add to your client over the course of the pandemic. Uh, with that question, we'll start with, uh, with Alan. Sure, sure. Thanks, Nick. Um, so yeah, so Descartes is in the, uh, the logistics technology space. We're helping people automate freight moves as, as you're moving goods from point A to point B. So obviously the pandemic was, uh, you know, uh, like most businesses, was, it was uh, interesting and, and, and uh, a difficult time, I guess, to start as we went through it. Um, so you go back a year um, from a transactional perspective, freight volumes dropped early in the pandemic. They've come back nicely since. So that was something we certainly had to deal with. And then from a, from a tailwinds perspective, because of the automation of freight, I think, you know, people have now come to realize more so in the last 12 months than ever, just how important the supply chain is uh, in, in the economic process. And so certainly from a tailwinds perspective or where we benefited, e-commerce as a trend is a, is a big issue for us. The use of data to make better decisions in, in freight moves is certainly an area that's benefited us. And the area of visibility, um, turning the lights on to third party freight so people see where their goods are. Um, it's been very much a, a beneficial area. People are you know, experiencing the, uh, the, the pain of not having product. And so when you know where the goods are and you can make better decisions based on, uh, based on that knowledge, that, that that's another area that's been, uh, been a nice tailwind for our business. So those are three areas that we've benefited and certainly seen the transactions come back nicely here in the, in the last six months as well. Okay, John, your experience? Yeah, well, in uh, you know the world, in our world at Canaxis, we are uh, providing our customers with um, with concurrent planning, end-to-end -end, um, concurrent planning, and essentially at the anchor of that uh, value proposition is hyper agility. And if there was ever a need for hyper agility, it's it's when something as disruptive as a global pandemic hits, or a stuck boat. Um, you know, in either case, you know, hyper agility is a is a key. Uh, capability, I'd say, or, um, and certainly what we saw when the pandemic hit is, uh, you know, we, we monitor usage, obviously, of our software uh, as a service, and we saw a pretty pronounced increase in the number of um, simulations being run. And, you know, this to me just meant there was an awful lot of trade-offs going on, uh, and, and you would expect that during, a, during something this disruptive, where you can't plan your way out of um, the circumstances that our customers uh, were feeling, you had to respond your way out every single day. Um, you know, it was like a box of chocolates, and, and maybe Alan would would uh, uh, would understand this side of the equation as well. We were hearing from customers that lanes were open, then open, then closed, 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 then open, and you know, situations were just completely untrustworthy. Um, so the the supply chain models themselves were. 
uh, you know, the assumptive parameters were, uh, were untrustworthy. And, and therefore, you know, responsive, uh, you know, being responsive was at the core of, of survival. And, uh, and, and that's at the core of what we do. You know, I, I think, um, you know, we recognize, at least this is what I heard that from practitioners that, you know, the, you know, the, the, I'd say the obsession over supply chain accuracy turned into an obsession for supply chain agility. Okay, and then uh, Peter. Yeah, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll go with a couple of specific examples. I mean, we're, you know, our, our business is uh, really supply chain focused ERP and supply chain execution for agile supply chain. So, you know, to take off John's point on agility, I mean, agility is kind of our game. Uh, we don't tend to win clients that have long-term sort of completely static, easily planned supply chains. We're, we're in markets where the supply chains are evolving very rapidly. Uh, but <laughs> if, you look, if you look at what happened in the pandemic, uh, we saw the biggest impact or area where we were able to make the biggest impact in two areas. One is more on the direct consumer side uh, as you know, a lot of companies that are in the direct consumer uh, game I uh, saw brick and mortar retail shut down, go into lockdown, uh, could no longer get goods to consumers that way. And so their e-com fulfillment, uh, you know, uh, just exploded. I mean, the numbers up dramatically, uh, you know, Columbia Sportswear, uh, we rolled them out last year uh, and North America and Europe, uh, you know, direct to consumer business across all their brands, uh, Columbia Sportswear, uh, Hard Hat, Sorel, et cetera all way, way up. So, you know, we were able to uh, cope with that volume. I mean, Black Friday was absolutely insane, uh, but it was, uh, we were able to cope with that volume and help them succeed in spite of all the, the lockdowns and, and retail closures. Um, you know, same with Sephora, Ubisoft, others, et cetera. Uh, on the healthcare side, it was interesting. Uh, you know, City of New York, for instance, we ended up back in, what was it, February, March last year when City of New York was in absolute horror show. Uh, and we ended up working with them over four days to spin up an emergency supplies distribution center to distribute all the ventilators and, and PPE equipment and so on out uh, while they were having their sort of very dark hour. Uh, we did some other uh, emergency uh, supplies uh, distribution warehouse launches as well. Uh, but for the bulk of our hospital clients, uh, it was really just a question of, you know, them taking advantage of the platform they'd already implemented. Um, uh, you know, we're sort of proud to say that the, the hospital networks that were running our platform uh, managed the pandemic better than the ones that didn't, frankly. Uh, the ones that have our platform knew where their stuff was, knew where to get it, knew what the ages were, the stuff wasn't all expiring on the shelf, uh, et cetera, and were able to, to manage the pandemic quite well. I mean, Mayo Clinic and Trinity Health and others uh, got through it uh, quite well. Okay. And so given your customers' experiences what, you know, we're, I would say we're probably halfway, hopefully past the halfway mark for that matter uh, of this pandemic, but maybe can you share with us what you think, uh, how your customers and prospects, how this pandemic has maybe changed their long-term thinking on what they were going to do? How, do, you, do you feel that, that they've, that the mindset as a result of the pandemic has resulted in uh, more more prospect business, more, more, more product demand. Just, just share with us any long-term thinking changes that have come from your customers as a result of this pandemic. And we'll start again with, uh, with Alan. Sure, sure. So I think if anything, um, some of the trends that have been in place even pre-pandemic, um, I guess in our feeling have been, have been brought forward or exaggerated by the pandemic. So the, the, the value in automation, I mean, I think all three companies that, that are speaking to you today, we're all in the you know, you know, supply chain and we're, we're probably more a little bit more logistics, but you know, and that's a more broader supply chain space and, and technology. And, and certainly if you looked at your know, supply chain functions you know, a number of years ago, it was a cost issue. Um, if anything, you know, we've seen this trend continuing that it's become more and more of a service element, right? This whole e-commerce piece that, uh, that Peter was alluding to. And, and, uh, and so we certainly see that, that being exaggerated by the, uh, by the pandemic. People are realizing, you know, my storefront shut down. I've got to move even faster towards e-commerce if I wasn't already thinking of doing so. Um, my, my employee base is at home. I've got to still be able to function. And even though I was looking at these different tools, 
you know, because we're automating most businesses out here, we're automating some, some processes that have been around for years. Goods have been moving, goods will move. But now that my employees are working from home, there's more and more e-commerce trend, um, you know, exaggerated or pulled forward the need for technology. And I think that's what we see continuing. These trends that were in place are now even more uh, prevalent and, and, and companies are focused on them. So, you know, for us, third-party freight visibility, right? Knowing where your goods are at any time, much like you know where your Uber, Uber uh, vehicle is at any time. Something that's been there, it's been an emerging trend, but even more important now than when we see the pain that if we don't, uh, if we're gonna be out of stock or our customer is gonna be out of stock that they're, they're concerned. So I would say that's an area where we've seen behavioral change, just a you know, pull forward of, of technology change. Okay. John, your, your observation? There you go, uh, uh, unmute. You'd think I'd get that right by now. Um, uh, I'd say over the last 10 months or so, I've, uh, I've interviewed maybe 50 or 60 chief supply chain officers from some of the largest um, enterprises on the planet and some small ones too, but I'll tell you they all, um, you know, there's a thesis emerging. You know, I, I would say one, um, Every board, every boardroom is asking their CEOs, what are you going to do next time? You know, I, I think, you know, supply chain is definitely um, surfaced to a board level discussion if it wasn't before. And, and through that simple question, they're basically saying, you know, what got us through the last 30 years will not survive the next 30. And so incrementalism is dead. You know, people are looking for a uh, generational shift, I would, I would say. And, and perhaps because, you know, this, um, this pandemic has caught every supply chain in every geography and every single manufacturer, um, you know, has affected them in a very uh, profound way simultaneously. It's not like a, a hurricane where it might affect a specific geography or a plant fire, a resin fire, and how that might affect the automotive industry. This is affecting every industry in every, um, every corner of the planet. And so, uh, you know, the conversations I'm having start with, do we have the governance model right? Um, and, and so they're really rethinking, you know, the, the, uh, the approach to what governs supply chain. And it's kind of steeped in a statement I made earlier about, you know, being so, so hyper-focused on accuracy and the pursuit of the perfect plan. There's a recognition that that is a fool's errand. And so uh, there has to be... Uh, a, an equal investment in, you know, a lot of the um, automation and systemic approaches, the, uh, you know, the um, optimization approaches, there has to be an equal investment in agility. And those two things are different. They're, they're very, very different. Um, and so that's, that's number one, I'd say. The other is, you know, the boil the ocean programs are also no longer being considered, you know, uh, conversations I'm having now, you know, the, with, with leaders, they're telling me, look, um, you know, I recognize that I need to transform what governs supply chain. But if you tell me it's going to take eight months or more, don't let the door hit you in the, you know, on your way out. Um, and so they're looking for, you know, a very rapid inoculation of their own, right? So lower my fever. I need to feel better before I'm going to cure myself, before I'm going to ultimately transform. And that's a different conversation than I'd been having, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, where very large grand scale transformations were being, you know, digital transformations were being conceived. Now it's, you know, can you get me, can you lower my fever in three months or less? Okay. And then, then we'll talk about the next phase, right? So that's been another, um, I'd say, difference in, in, uh, in conversation. Okay, and Peter. Yeah, I, I mean, I would I would agree with uh, Alan and John. I think they've they've covered most of the bases. I mean, we've seen acceleration in e-commerce. That is a change that's not going to go away. I mean, we went from sort of sixteen percent of the average consumer retail spend being done online pre-pandemic to sort of I think we hit a high of twenty-seven or twenty-eight percent during the pandemic. Uh, doesn't look like it's going to go back. I mean, the expectation is that that's going to continue at that kind of spend. So the net result is that it's, it's accelerating a lot of the other uh, changes, long-term changes that were being made to the whole supply chain. I mean, 
I mean, e-commerce is going to re-engineer the entire supply chain end to end over the next 10 years. Uh, and, and so that trend was already there, but I think it's accelerating it. Uh, you know, the, how were people reacting to some of the impact of the pandemic? I mean, it, it, say it's already been touched on, I think, but I'm finding like even procurement guys now we talk to in supply chain, uh, they want to know where the stuff actually comes from now. Uh, they didn't really care before. Uh, you know, if a procurement guy in healthcare was buying N95 masks, he was shopping on price. Uh, and if supplier A was 2% cheaper than supplier B, supplier A got the order. Uh, well, now they want to know where's this stuff coming from? And if I'm buying from three different suppliers to diversify my risk, but all the suppliers are getting their stuff out of Wuhan, uh, then I haven't really diversified my risk. Uh, you know, we saw that initially a few years ago when a hurricane hit Puerto Rico. Uh, and a number of our customers in healthcare, it was a wake up call for them even back then, uh, you know, again, they thought they had diversified their drug supply to make sure they had three different suppliers of a drug only to find out when that hurricane hit that all of the manufacturers were literally in the same section of Puerto Rico. Uh, so, you know, the, so now the, this whole sort of where is it coming from and how much of a premium am I prepared to pay on risk reduction is just a new formula. I mean, it just becomes part of the procurement algorithm now. And it really wasn't before. Uh, so I think you're going to find people are willing to pay more for a shorter supply chain. Uh, and short supply chains are more agile. I mean, just by definition, they are more agile. So I think there's going to be a trend to shorter supply chains and a willingness to put some kind of a premium on risk reduction. Okay. And that's a good segue into my next question, probably my, my favorite question. When you said uh, shorter supply chains... Uh, procurement, knowing where the product comes from. Obviously, on the screen, we've got we've got the the planning side of the equation with Canaxis, the the what I call the execution side of the equation with with Texas, and the logistics side of the equation with, with Descartes. Given maybe what your customers are experiencing through this pandemic and and the need for or e-commerce, yes, here to stay. Uh, procurement, knowing where product is coming from, making sure I have enough product in the whole process. Just, I want to gather your observations individually on what needs to change in the whole supply chain world over the next 10 years. In other words, when you look at what the three of you guys bring to the table, do you think we need to see a consolidation um, from the planning to the execution logistics side in order to deliver faster and, and, uh, and tighter on the procurement side, you know, just that, that whole uh, equation. So uh, again, I'll start with, uh, with Alan. Sure, sure. I, I think, um, you know, the long answer to that question, I think is a yes. Um, I think that, that, you know, over time um, that these areas do, they, they, they may be uh, different uh, addressable markets today, but they're sitting side by side uh, to each other at, a, at three areas. And I think that does make sense. I think if we think about it more in the near term, uh, and I think I'll let John and Peter speak to their businesses, but I, I do know little bits about their businesses. You know, they're both in areas that are growing. Our area in the logistics space is certainly growing. Um, the, the tide is rising in all these areas as people see the pain points that we've just been talking about. This, the pain points coming from e-commerce and the, and the change in the value prop to supply chains. Um, so that's creating growth. Um, for us, we see our addressable market and we see tons and tons of solutions that are out there. We do over 100 things today to help people with their, their logistics functions. And there's a whole bunch that, you know, that a bunch of other competitors uh, that would provide to, to the likes of the big, you know, transport companies or, or brokers and forwarders. Um, so, you know, so what we see sort of in the next little while is that, that there's a continued incredible consolidation opportunity just in front of us in just purely in the logistics space. Um, play that out over years, perhaps, and I don't know how long that period is, then, it, then the, there's merit to what you talk about. Um, but I think that as, as there's growth in all these markets, that's probably something that comes as growth subsides in the next 10, 15, whatever number of years uh, you know, ahead. So that would be the you know, early thoughts as far as the short-term impacts and long-term. Okay, and John, your, your thoughts on that short-term, long-term? Yeah, I, you know, I think there's a, well, there's two perspectives. There's the perspective of the practitioner uh, and what governs their thought process and, you know, what's required over the, the short, mid and long term. And I, and I think, 
like I, I started saying, the, the, the focus on, um, you know, on, on shifting technique is, you know, first and foremost, there's a focus on, uh, you know, optimizing time, speed to detect leads to speed to correct, right? So it's, it's less, that's what, that's what's driving this, this hyper agility agenda. As it relates to the technologies that ultimately enable that, um, well, certainly at Canaxis, you know, anything we look at uh, that violates the, you know, I'd say the ability to plan and manage concurrently loses its value. It just creates lethargy. And, uh, and so, um, you know, we're, I, I think a lot less about, uh, you know, about the, the M&A strategy as it, you know, uh, I'd say a la E2 Open, where, you know, you, you, uh, it's a collection of, uh, of disparate systems. Uh, in our world, I think about it as, you know, how can I um, look at opportunities to service what practitioners want most? And that's the, you know, the collapsing of cycle time. You know, it's all about speed. How quickly do I know I'm out of kilter? And it's not just about visibility. The other thing I'm seeing really drive the agenda is visibility is not enough. Visibility is to see a thing. Transparency is to understand what you see. And, and so anything that leads to that uh, end state, I think is going to serve, well, certainly serve us, but more importantly, serve the practitioners that are really driving the agenda for the future. Okay. And Peter. Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you, you know, your question about consolidation, I think you can look at it two ways, you know, consolidation in the sort of the software space, what's sort of happening there. And I, I would sort of go back to what, you know, to Alan's point. I mean, at this point, there is so much growth in this space uh, that I don't think you're likely to see that much consolidation for the next sort of eight to 10 years. I mean, I, you know, I look at our company, I mean, you know, the past 12 months, you know, during pandemic, you know, revenue up, whatever it is, 18 to 20% or something, book, bookings up 75, 80%. I mean, it's, it's sort of go, go, go even in a pandemic. And I mean, that's, you know, that's when sort of new account sales are actually going pretty slowly during the pandemic and so on. And even so it's just go, go, go. So that's not typically the kind of an environment you see a lot of M&A in. In the end user space, you know, you know, the markets we're targeting, I think it all comes down to the type of products that are going through the supply chain. I mean, there are, there are companies that produce product that simply sell very well all the way through the supply chain to consumer. Uh, without the brand owner ever having to control anything past the point of manufacture. Uh, but there are a lot of other companies that want to own the entire consumer experience. And they, the consumer experience is often, you know, it, it's such a big part of the buying decision. So, I mean, if you look at some of those clients I mentioned earlier, Sephora, I mean, Sephora wants to own the whole consumer experience. Uh, so they're not going to run their product just through an Amazon or, a, you know, some other platform. They want that direct relationship. They want to own it all the way through, uh, you know, and, and there's a lot of clients we deal with that are, that are seeing it that way, that the whole experience is part of the product. Uh, so I think, I, I suspect there is going to be consolidation of platforms in the space, you know, around a Shopify type platform or a Amazon type platform for the companies that aren't necessarily as concerned about owning the entire experience. Uh, but there's a whole other branch of the market where I don't think you will ever see consolidation uh, because they want to have that direct consumer relationship. They want to own the whole thing. And I, I mean, at this point, all of these various brands are battling for the consumer doorstep. I mean, we've moved from, you know, the battle in excellence of manufacturing and brand positioning and everything to now it's all about uh, who owns the consumer doorstep. So I think that's going to, for a lot of those guys, that's going to argue against uh, much consolidation. Okay. So moving on to product development and the idea of building a smarter supply chain in general, obviously technology will be at the forefront of delivering that, that leaner model. I know in, in the case of uh, Descartes, blockchain has been thrown out there as a potential uh, technology that can be deployed in the case of Canaxis, uh, Texas, um, AI, machine learning have been technologies that you guys have already started to implement. So maybe walk us through what emerging technologies you guys um, uh, are either focusing on or, or continue to build upon. Whereabouts you think you are in your respective developments? You know, what, 
I like to use the ball game analogy, first inning, second inning, et cetera. And, and maybe when you look out five, 10 years, AI, blockchain, machine learning, what, what product gaps, again, technology-wise, do you guys see within your respective organizations? Do you think that your customers are, are suggesting to you or, or you're gleaming from the marketplace that you think you're going to need uh, in, 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 short, in the short while to get you ready for the next five, 10 years? And we'll, we'll go back to Alan. Yeah, sure. So, so I think, you know, come back to some of the, the more macro trends, right? Uh, we've been talking about e-commerce and it's, it's here to stay, as Peter said. Um, and we certainly agree with that. And, and the pain points that's putting on and the, and the, and the spotlight that's being, that's being put on the supply chain and the logistics functions within organizations today. So these are the, these are the, the trends our, all our customers are dealing with. And how do these technologies factor into that? So you mentioned about blockchain. Um, for us, we run a network um, connecting trade parties. Uh, blockchain is a type of transaction to us. We spent a lot of time being involved in various group studies and think tanks and blockchain is, is going to enter into the logistics function. Um, you're going to pay more, uh, you know, blockchain is going to be a more expensive way than just connecting. You know, when we're sending messages, we're not a trusted intermediary. We're not paid to tell you that that's right. We're just paid to, to connect you. Um, and so it's hard to replace that pennies on the transaction type of cost with blockchain, but you will do so when it's valuable goods or it's something that needs to be traced where chain of custody is important. So we see blockchain entering into our network as a type of transaction, a higher value type of transaction. In other elements of our business, we certainly see uh, you know, AI and machine learning. These are gonna be elements that factor into the products to different degrees. In our databases, while well, we are, you know, people are looking at our databases because they will help in this area, right? They'll, the, the, the data from the past is going to be help, help in the being predictive for the future. And so people are looking at our databases that way. We're also looking at in very many ways how this impacts, you know, our different products. And, and it will to varying degrees have an impact on our products where we can use that predictability to make a better decision that will then benefit our customers from a logistics, uh, a move perspective in moving goods. So certainly it's an issue. Um, we're probably in the early innings um, and, and there's still a long way to play out here. Um, we certainly see it as a long-term trend that we're watching and, and gonna be involved with. And John? Yeah, certainly we're, we're monitoring a lot of the, the emerging technologies. And while you know, those computer scientists um, around the world would know machine learning and AI uh, has been around for probably 30 years in some form, but uh, marketing's got a hold of it now. And, uh, and so it is uh, being really pushed to the forefront. Um, and what we're learning uh, about it is it definitely has its, its, its advantages and, and its uses. We're, we're investing quite heavily in this, te uh, this type of technology. It was one of the key pillars behind, uh, or key motives behind our acquisition of RubiCloud um, you know, strengthening our bench, our bench there around uh, ML and AI. Uh, I will say, you know, the primary uh, use case in supply chain for that type of technology is to automate the obvious with confidence. You know, I, you know, more confidence and automate the obvious. I don't want humans to be, um, you know, spending their finite utiles of energy on things that are completely obvious. They should be leveraged for trade-off decisions and uh, exercising creativity and ingenuity um, when problems are extremely difficult and, and where compromise is required. And so we're investing in that area. We're also investing in what we call the self-healing supply chain. For me, the supply chain is a machine. It's a virtual machine designed by human beings with intended performance, right? So I, you know, I, I intend it to perform in a certain way. You feed it demand. And, uh, and you get performance from it. You know, where machine learning and AI can really help is to continuously monitor the design of that machine, the design of your supply chain, as demonstrated against as designed. And if, you know, the al this is where the algorithms can sense, you know, whether the design elements of a supply chain are falling, all falling outside of some tolerance level that humans may not detect because they're, they're quite fast moving, um, and quite complex, and there's often hundreds and hundreds of thousands of elements uh, to monitor. And so, you know, that's an area of, uh, of technology that will definitely assist in, in, um, in the 
agile equation. If you can automate the obvious and, and not have human beings doing, uh, you know, spending their energy on things they shouldn't be doing. You know, we're also focused on, um, you know, looking at the potential for, in, in our case, expanding rapid response to public cloud uh, as, a, as an expansion opportunity uh, as we continue to grow. Because we have also seen, um, you know, and I made this, this point during the last earnings call that our, our um, prospects and our pipeline are now, you know, moving much more into the mid-market uh, segment where, where in the past we might have been, you know, more aggressively focused on enterprise class. And, uh, and so that has us, you know, focused on, um, you know, on the, on the public cloud. And then lastly, you know, um, we've come to realize, you know, having served the world's largest tofu manufacturer and, and companies that make missile systems, you know, so you couldn't see two more diverse types of supply chain and everything in between. Um, you know, we're following the, the, the Mark Benioff model, I'll say, right, where, you know, we're not necessarily uh, sure exactly where the market will lead. Uh, and yet we want to be prepared for when they lead us. And so as a result, we've invested in what we call rapid response as a platform, similar to what Salesforce did, force.com. This was a, a strategy that basically says, you know, I'm going to create the conditions for innovation to be done by third parties or customers themselves. And that essentially is, um, you know, is our, our bet, if you will, in, in driving future state technologies faster. Okay. And Peter? Yeah, I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, for us, blockchain has never been much of a factor in our space, but uh, from a standpoint of AI and, and ML to some extent, the, the opportunities are clearly where you can narrowly define the problem. Uh, and I think that's, you know, John's line he used there a couple of times, automate the obvious. I mean, that's what it comes down to is, is finding those fi fairly narrowly defined use cases but that are quite repetitive and where you have the data available. Uh, you know, I think very often data doesn't get nearly enough attention in the whole uh, AI and ML equation. I mean, if you, you know, I think it's one of the reasons why so many AI companies have failed. They, they've ended up, you know, these dedicated AI companies, they've ended up with sort of brilliant AI engineers, but without access to the data that they actually need to drive the, the machine learning. Uh, you know, the, we have used for a few years, we've been using machine learning in the area of uh, demand planning and forecasting and sort of rapid reaction within a distributed supply chain uh, to be able to, you know, react and sense to changes in demand based on various factors. Uh, you know, a, a heart surgeon that retires and suddenly the utilization of certain, you know, heart catheters drops in a certain area and be able to sense that and pick it up because of course nobody bothers to tell supply chain that he retired. Uh, and suddenly you have eight years supply of that stent on hand instead of, you know, 30 days. Uh, so, so we've always had that kind of, you know, machine learning built into the platform. Some of the areas we're looking at now, you know, if you picture a, a, a warehouse with, <coughs> you know, 500,000 square feet and a whole bunch of workers and a whole bunch of forklifts, uh, about 80% of the labor in that warehouse is spent on travel time. Uh, it's not pick time at the, at the shelf. It's not pack time. It's actually just traveling to the pick zone to pick or traveling back to the conveyor to put it on. It's a huge percentage of the time is spent on travel. So it's a classic uh, machine learning type uh, situation where you can analyze the layout of the facility, analyze the, the behavior of the people, uh, and then begin to tell the people exactly what orders to do things in, which lanes to travel down, you can sense the fact that there's often a traffic jam in aisle two uh, at certain times of day and divert people around that uh, location so that you don't end up with traffic pileups. So the, the payoff is, is fairly immediate and fairly obvious, and yet the problem is narrowly defined. Uh, and, you know, innings wise, yeah, I would say we're still just in the first innings. I mean, it, you know, it's, there's, uh, there's still actually a lot of skepticism out there. I think there's been too many failed uh, uh, AI and ML projects. So there's, there's a lot more skepticism. A couple of years ago, I think at the board level, there was a lot of uh, sort of silver bullet wishful thinking around this. Uh, we're past that. We're now kind of into the trough of disillusionment. And, you know, we're, we're going to come out the other side with some real, uh, real solutions. Okay. So when we 
stepping back on the pandemic itself, you know, kind of got a lesson learned. What would you do better the next time around? So what, what would be your primary takeaway if, if you, given what you know now, if you could go back a year ago, or given what you know now, should we have another exogenous shock to, to the supply chains? What do you think, what was probably the biggest lesson learned that you could do next time better, whether it's operationally or whether it's uh, from a sales perspective or whether it's from advice to clients in terms of them managing their, their own supply chains and, and logistics. So Alan, back to you on that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, you mentioned, uh, you know, what would we do differently? I think, I think from our perspective, um, you know, and this is, you know, you can look at it from a post perspective. We, we run, uh, you know, very, very, uh, you know, diverse products. Uh, we, we've got a number of different products across a number of different customers. So we're, you know, 23,000 customers, uh, over a hundred solutions. So we're very, very diverse. And we went into the pandemic and probably played defense for the first two months, like probably everybody. It was a, it was a scary time. And, um, and I'm not sure as I think about that, I'm not sure we would really, even though it turned out probably a lot of the defensive thinking was not used the business was extremely resilient, um, proved to be, you know, we had, had a great year as, as, a, as the other companies here did as well last year. Um, and so we, we made of, you know, misplace that energy. I'm not sure I would do it differently though. I think if any of these types of, of panicked situations, the way we run our business is we would think um, conservatively to start and then branch out from there. And I think, uh, so even if we realize that those defensive efforts were not utilized to, uh, to any great extent, it was probably not a wasted effort and something that's logical to do. Um, you know, I think, I think we've, we've invested, we, we quickly sort of, because 30% of our population work from home, we were quickly able to adapt from that and, and we were ready there. So I'm not sure that was a, a, a change that we would have, you know, made differently. Um, but I think uh, addressing sort of the customer concerns um, getting out a little bit in front of, of where our, our solutions would, uh, see, seeing where our solutions would be beneficial to the customers, maybe a little bit quicker on that perhaps. But uh, overall, we think we're pretty pleased with the response we had to, uh, it was a pretty, you know, um, a difficult time. And John, your thoughts? Yeah, I, um, you know, 2020, uh, you know, hindsight's always 2020. We always look back and say, you know, what did we learn? Um, and, you know, hopefully this is a once in a lifetime experience for all of us. Um, haven't seen one for over a hundred years and hopefully we don't see another one like this for, you know, many more hundreds of years. Uh, when I think about what we learned, um, you know, what went well, what didn't, I think for one thing, uh, you know, the recognition that uh, our, our solutions needed to be packaged for speed, you know, pre-packaged, this what we call rapid start. Um, the, you know, the, the pandemic, I'd, I'd say, was a key catalyst to packaging, um, you know, packaging our value proposition inside of a 12-week window. Um, and, and, you know, I, we did it, which is great. I would have loved to do it a little faster. You know, I had, you know, hindsight, we were like, man, if we were ready with this on day one, uh, but of course, we just, you know, our business didn't necessarily see it um, as being critical to our success. And we've been seeing, you know, as you know, success as the, as the years, um, you know, as the years progressed. So, so I'd say this notion of rapid, rapid start um, uh, as a packaging equation was pretty critical. You know, the things I'm still very proud of, uh, of, of Canaxis and, and all of the, the women and men there that, um, that made 2020 possible. We never withheld guidance and we hit our number. Um, and that wasn't necessarily true for a lot of uh, companies. And so we, you know, part of that is the confidence in the business and the confidence in our value proposition, the confidence in the pipeline. Um, we also grew headcount by over 50% in 2020. Um, we call them the class of 2020. Many of them, most of them, Maybe all of them we have not met face to face, uh, but I'm I'm very proud of of our HR team and, and the hiring managers that didn't uh, didn't let up um, on on that front. Um, so you know I, I I'd say a bit a bit of a mixed um, reaction to that question, but like Alan, I don't know that I would have necessarily preemptively changed anything. We we were learning as we were going. 
you know, it's a first, there's no, there was no manual necessarily to read to say this is what you do when a global pandemic hits. Um, you know, so, so we definitely leaned on each other uh, quite a bit uh, as a team. And very quickly, uh, we'd run out of space in our building, for example. So we'd already had a work from home protocol. Uh, we just exercised that protocol worldwide. And we didn't have to reinvent that protocol, which was, which was really good. The only thing I could think of, Nick, is really, you know, having seen this notion of packaging a 12-week go-live value proposition, um, which, which is, uh, you know, picking up steam for us. And Peter? Yeah, I, I've been thinking about this too, and I don't know what I would have done differently. I mean, I, I think one thing this pandemic has proven is that our collective ability to uh, forecast human behavior uh, in this type of an environment is zero. Uh, so, so, you know, we, we just, I mean, who would have expected that right now housing prices would be through the roof. And, you know, if you're trying to build a house, you'd it'd take you eight months to get a roof truss and uh, like, like who would have thought, right. Uh, but, you know, here we are, uh, you know, so, so our, you know, when it first hit, uh, we hit the brakes on hiring for about 45 days uh, and then realized that was a screw up uh, and sort of shifted back onto the gas pedal. Uh, we raised capital last April uh, on the premise that, you know, we had no idea how long this pandemic was going to last, but we knew it was going to be severe and we wanted to have a fat balance sheet going through it. Uh, and we also thought, again, turns out wrongly, uh, that there'd be some really great uh, acquisition opportunities as sort of companies, you know, collapsed in, as the economy collapsed going into this, uh, this pandemic. Well, that didn't happen either. I mean, you know, most software companies survived and thrived. And in fact, valuations moved up and, uh, and so on. So we're, you know, I mean, at this point, we're coming out of this thing with more cash on the balance sheet than we need, frankly. And, uh, and, you know, in hindsight, should we have taken that dilution? I don't know. At the same time, if another one of these hit uh, two years from now, I don't know that I'd do anything different. I think I'd still, first of all, hit the brake. Uh, I'd want to make sure my balance sheet was really strong uh, and sort of then let the chips fall where they may kind of thing. Uh, you know, for our customers, uh, our, you know, they were already looking at shortening supply chains because of geopolitical changes, rising tariff barriers, uh, rising nationalism, uh, a, a bit of a collapsing belief in, in globalism. Uh, so they were already trending towards looking at shortening their supply chains, finding onshore suppliers, finding, you know, manufacturers that were using robotics to, to move the, the product production back onshore, et cetera. Uh, I think this pandemic has accelerated that. So, so suddenly the idea that a supply chain that spans the globe is a safe supply chain just isn't really believed anymore. So, so for critical product, at least, uh, I think the supply chains are going to get a lot shorter. And that's one of the lessons learned coming out of this. Okay. And then just, I'm going to sneak in one question here and then we'll wrap it up. Um, obviously all three business models have a professional services revenue component. So when you guys look at professional services revenue, how do you guys, for every dollar earned on that front, how much ARR do you anticipate that, that uh, revenue generating, again, from an ARR perspective? Is there, is there some sort of a ratio that you guys anticipate uh, for your respective uh, businesses? Alan, I'll start with you because as the CFO, it's probably the easier one for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly something we look at. Uh, so number of different products that we offer, obviously, from the network uh, through the databases to the software. So it varies um, by solution. Um, the PS in a, in a, in a, net, in a data uh, sale is, is virtually nothing. You send them a link and they subscribe and they, they enter into the database. In our routing solutions, it would be much different where we have to uh, map all the data and put it into the, the routing algorithm. Overall, it's around $10 of ARR for every dollar of PS. Uh, that's roughly what our consolidated numbers look like. So, you know, 9% of our revenue is coming from uh, PS, about 90% coming from, uh, from uh, subscription services. Okay. And John? Yes. In our business, um, and primarily, I'd say, um, in the enterprise space where we're dealing with 
you know, behemoth, very large uh, corporations with, you know, in some cases, hundreds of factories. There is some lifting involved in, in, uh, in, in uh, transitioning them to a concurrent planning model. At the same time, you know, our, we look at professional services as, you know, subscription enablement uh, as, a, as a primary motivator uh, for that function. And, you know, we have, um, you know, our, our growth engine, if you will, is the subscription service, similar to what Alan was saying. Uh, and that's what we, that we, that's what we focus on. And, you know, so our intention is certainly not to grow professional services. We have it. Um, it's, it's a necessity in some cases for strategic accounts. But as, as you know, Nick, we've, you know, for many years now, we've been investing heavily in a partner ecosystem to pick up the, the you know, uh, the lion's share of professional services and help us scale. We recognize that we can't grow organically fast enough without partners delivering, uh, delivering the service. So we'll, you know, on, on any given quarter it might fluctuate, um, you know, but I would say, you know, it's between it. We're, we're striving towards that 80 to 20, uh, 80, 20 rule, 80% so subscription revenue and 20% um, on the professional services side. The pandemic, you know, we certainly had a lot of customers leaning in on us saying, hey, we need to accelerate things. We need to use your people for sustainment services. Um, and, and we saw some, uh, some, I'd say, inflation there as demand really picked up. Where, where our own employees did not have enough staff. Uh, sorry, our own customers did not have enough staff to absorb the, the impacts of, of the pandemic. And so we stepped in obviously with our acquisition of uh, Prana Consulting and sustainment services to help that. But uh, on the, in the long term, it's for us, it's an 80-20. Okay, and then Peter, last. Yeah, I mean, and we're we're earlier on the transition to SaaS than than these other two companies. You know, we were still full on prem up until about three years ago. So the transition to SaaS is more recent. If you look at where we are today, uh, in a you know, and you have to remember, I mean, ARR that first <laughs> that first word is annual. So if you look at it typically today on a new contract, if there's a million dollars of consulting, the ARR is probably half a million. Uh, but then of course the ARR is, is recurring year after year and the consulting does not repeat. So, so we're going to see that normalize over time. I mean, a typical client stays with us for 20 to 25 years. We have about a, you know, historically we've had about a 96% annual renewal rate in our customer base. So that upfront consulting is a fairly big factor. Now it's going to drop over time as the, as the, uh, recurring revenue rises, and the, you know, the consulting, the whole ecosystem thing is really picking up speed for us now. Uh, you know, a few years ago, we were doing it all on our own. Today, a lot of our clients have KPMG or Deloitte or Accenture involved in getting the consulting done. So that's also beginning to, uh, you know, decrease the need to grow professional services at the same rate as the rest of the business. Okay, great. Thank you. So, uh, you know, that, that concludes our, uh, our panel discussion. I want to thank Alan, John and Peter for joining us today. It's much appreciated, and we look to have you guys back uh, next year, hopefully in person. And um, so thanks again, guys. And I'll uh, just remind everyone on the call that we have the digital healthcare panel that starts at 1245. So thanks again, guys. Great. Thank thanks, you. Mate. Thanks. Okay. Take care.